peace and chance. Okay. Project Pierce Passion and Play. And I think I have not to introduce Mitchell to this auditorium. I think you know that Mitchell is working at the lifelong kindergarten group, he's leading this group at MIT, and he's, uh, I say, the inventor of Scratch. I think I can say this. Uh, and he was participating in all the constructionism conferences so far. Yes, yes, not this one. So I feel a special connection to this community because the work that I'll be talking about today really grows out of the work that this community represents from over the past several decades. Um, in talking today about this topic of give peace a chance with projects, peers, passion, and play, this is the way that we frame our work these days. And it grew out of a project we've done over the last couple of years with a couple of my colleagues, I've been teaching an online course called Learning Creative Learning. This is a course that I was developing with my colleagues Philip Schmidt and Natalie Russ. And in our group, we've been talking about our approach to learning as creative learning because we've recognized that in a fast-changing world like today's society, that nothing is more important than the ability to think and act creatively. So we see that our work is really uh, aimed at trying to help all young people develop as creative thinkers so that they can be active participants in such a fast-changing world. And if we want people to be creative thinkers and creative learners, we want to develop tools and activities and strategies to help parents and teachers and others support young people in creative learning. So therefore, we call it learning creative learning. How can we help people learn about the process of creative learning? And as we thought about this, the way that we ended up coming up with some guiding principles to talk about our approach for supporting creative learning. And that's where this idea of the four P's has come. And again, these ideas are not new ones to this community. It's our, our way these days of talking about it. We find this is our way of communicating many of the ideas that have grown out of the constructionism community over the years. I was going to organize my talk around how we've applied these guiding principles to our current work as we've been developing new technologies and activities. So in particular, I will take a look at our group's work on the Scratch programming language and community and show how we've been guided in our design by thinking about projects, peers, passion, and play. So let me start by talking about projects. And to talk about projects, I was going to talk about an activity that probably many of you are familiar with that happened during this past year. Last December, there was this big activity called Hour of Code that took place in December. It was initiated by a group called the Code.org and is part of the growing interest in coding around the world. And this was an effort to try to get young people everywhere to spend an hour learning to code. Um, and many people did participate. It seems I took this from their website a few days ago or a few weeks ago. 40 million people participated. 
But for me, what was interesting was not the number of people that participated, although that's what gets promoted. For me, what was interesting was the different ways that different the different ways that were used to engage young people in coding. Because to me, there's no one approach for learning to code, and there could be many different things that people get out of different approaches for learning to code. So that's what I want to talk about. Let me start by talking about the way that the scratch approach for learning to code, and then I'll talk about some other approaches. So from the scratch community, my colleague Karen Brennan and her colleagues at the, on the Scratch Ed team at Harvard Graduate School of Education, where she's now on the faculty, they developed the tutorial to help people get started with Scratch as part of the Hour of Code. So they developed a video and materials to help people create a holiday card. So the idea was to engage people in a project of creating a card to celebrate the holiday season. And when this was put online, in fact, thousands and thousands of people use Scratch to create a holiday card. This is the studio or gallery that was created with thousands of projects from around the world of people creating their holiday cards. Let me just show you a couple examples to give you a spirit of it. This is from a community center in Boston. They collectively created this project. where they put themselves into the holiday card, and you'll see different people from this community center. It's the South End Technology Center in Boston. And again, as in many scratch projects, it brings together art and music. The kids are So this is nearby now, in Boston. We also heard some missions from around the world from here in Europe. Here's what I believe is in Catalan, so this is another submission. Very much in the spirit of learning to write. 
So learning to code in our mind is very similar to when children learn to write, they're able to tell their own stories, to share ideas. Now instead of with learning to write, you can write a holiday card and send it to somebody. Now you can make an interactive holiday card and send it to somebody. So we see this as a new type of, of literacy for people to be able to take their ideas, share their ideas with the world. But this does not automatically happen with coding. Although to us, and I think to those of us in the constructions of community, it seems natural that coding should come as part of a project, as part of a way of creating things and expressing yourself. But that's not the way all of the world sees it. Although there's 40 million people contributing to Hour of Code, most of them are not working on projects. They're not necessarily working on things in what I think would be seen as a constructionist spirit. So let me show some of the other examples. The most common tutorial that was used was one where, you, again, write your first computer program. But rather than working on a project, it's put in terms of a puzzle, where you have a certain goal to have, and you have to put together the blocks. And again, the program is very similar to a scratch. It's graphical program blocks that you snap together. But the activity, in my mind, has a very different feel. It's about giving a specific goal, and everybody has to put together their solution for reaching that goal. So it's a problem-solving activity, not a project design activity. And I think many of the things that we value of learning by designing and creating and expressing yourself are missing if it gets reduced to just a solving a puzzle activity. And many of the other examples on the Hour of Code website are similar. Here's one from Lightbox. Similarly, a different type of puzzle piece that you put together to make a virtual robot move around. Now, I'm not saying that there's something wrong with these activities. I do think people are learning something when they solve these puzzles. It's not that this is necessarily a bad activity. When I was growing up, I'm sure I would have enjoyed doing this. And I do think the kids doing this learn something. But again, making the analogy with learning to write, I see solving these puzzles is somewhat like solving a crossword puzzle. Many of us enjoy solving cro crossword puzzles. I think it's a great activity to work on crossword puzzles. But if you really want someone to become fluent with language, to be able to express themselves, you wouldn't just give them crossword puzzles. Crossword puzzles can help you extend your vocabulary. It's not necessarily going to let you become a fluent member who's actually contributing to the, to the conversations in your community. So for me, that's what we want to aim for when we bring new approaches to coding, is to make sure that it really is developing a type of fluency like writing, where everyone can develop their own voice tell their own stories, create their own projects. So that's the first P, of making sure we focus on a project-based approach, where people are really creating something that they can share with the world, not just learning to solve problems, as valuable as it might be to solve problems or to solve puzzles. Problems and puzzles are two other Ps, but I didn't put them in the list. So we'll go to the next P, of peers. And when we created Scratch, we launched it seven years ago in 2007, we didn't just create a programming language. We also created an online community at the same time. And we felt that that was very important because we wanted to make sure that young people, as they created things, if we wanted them to develop their voice, to express their ideas, they needed other people to share their ideas with. And I think this was a real limitation in many programming approaches of the past. And partly the technology was not there. And today, we fortunately uh, you know, have the technological infrastructure to make it easier for people to share online and communicate online. So when we developed Scratch, we have the Scratch website where when someone puts up a project, this is, I just grabbed today one of the reach featured projects on the homepage of Scratch. So you can there play with the project. And this is a custom pet that you create. You can go inside and look at the code. But in addition to looking at the programming, there's also a social side to the website, website where people are interacting with their peers. You can see this project, this says the number of views. This project has been viewed 8,500 times. So that's one way of interacting with peers, by people looking at it. People can say that they love it. They can add it to their list of favorites to be able to look at it later. They can write comments. So there's 1,600 comments on this project where people might give advice or say how they might do it differently. It also could be remixed. So when someone looks at the code, they can make changes in the code. So this was remixed 27 times. 
So people within the community are actively sharing their ideas with one another. And we see that as a, a central element to the creative learning process. Not just be creating on your own, but be doing it as part of a community of peers. And we see this one of the most active parts of the website. Every month there's more than 1.5 million comments on the Scratch website. Um, these are things that we supported in the community from the beginning of being able to love things or write comments. But we continue to learn from the community as we watch and see how the community works with one another. And part of what we do you know, in our work with Scratch is to see how is the community using this and how can we better support their activities. So one thing that took us by surprise and that we've been following is the way that a lot of young people have been using the Scratch website to create tutorials for others, to help other people learn. Now when we developed Scratch, we developed some tutorials on our own in Scratch to help people learn. And we expected some educators would make tutorials. We never imagined that so many kids would make tutorials. There are literally hundreds and thousands of tutorials made by kids. Some of them are gathered together into different studios or galleries. This one's called Tutorial Madness. This one's just brought together lots of tutorials made by kids. And there are all different types of tutorials. Some are tutorials about how to do artwork in Scratch. This is a step-by-step -step tutorial on how to make an anime character and paint at them. Here's a project that's called Scrolling Done Right. It's telling you how to make a scrolling background in Scratch. That's not a very easy thing to do in Scratch. So young people in the community found out how they can make a scrolling background and then they share their ideas with each other. As you can see, this one's been shared 9,000 times and the remix was at 390 sometimes. So it's getting very active where people share their ideas and influencing many other people. Here's one about mathematical ideas that could be useful as you're working on Scratch. How to use trigonometric ratios in Scratch. This one didn't get watched as many times. <laughs> and then also, projects about how to make use of the website itself. Here's one of my favorite projects. Uh, from a boy who's giving advice on how to get your projects popular on the Scratch website. How to get your projects popular. Step one. <coughs> Take time over your project to make it a decent project. That way people are more likely going to love your project. Step two. Add lots of people to your f list of friends. Then you're more likely going to have people to love your project. Step three. Add your project to a gallery, so then when people are searching through other people's galleries, they'll find your project. Step four. A lot of these are just great wisdom for life, not just for this project. <laughs> <laughs> we also saw, this was created by young people in the community who made a gallery called Scratch Tasks, where both people who needed help could say, you know, here's a project I'm having problems with and other people could offer their help. So it's asked for both of us, it's the best way to find people to do tasks, to find tasks complete. So, and actually they use a currency, that they'll say, if you help me, I'll, get, I'll love some of your projects. So there's a whole trading marketplace of helping one another. Although, as we saw this, we saw that, in fact, this marketplace of trading expertise wasn't working so well. So this is a place where the Scratch team uh, came in to try to help out, so a group of people you know, in our, on the team came and said, how can we better support young people who clearly want to help each other? Uh, so actually, Champika Fernando, one of the graduate students in the group, she's doing her master's uh, research on this along with others in the group, has worked on making new galleries like once called the Scripps Workshop. It was designed specifically to where people can help others with scripts. And they had a whole system set up where people could volunteer to become script helpers. If you're a script helper, you become in a certain forum where you get advice, not just about how to do good scripting in Scratch, but how to be a, a good mentor, how to help other people. You don't just tell them the answer, but you support them and help understand what they're trying to do. So it's a process not just to help the helpers learn more about Scratch, but help them learn about pedagogical strategies for helping one another. Um, so they're now, you know, I think this just came up a couple months ago, this started. You know, there have been more than 100 projects where people have put up their projects and they ask for help, and some of the script helpers have come in and helped them out. 
I mean, I'll just give one more example that, again, initiated from the community, and then we supported it to integrate it into the whole uh, ecosystem of Scratch. So it's the welcoming committee. That when new people join the Scratch community, sometimes they don't know where to go or how to meet others. About right now, there's more than 5,000 people join the community every day. So we want to have a better way. Some of the existing members of the community wanted to have ways that they could help out the newcomers. So they want to share some of their experience. So they formed a welcoming committee, and then we worked with them to make it into the system. When someone now joins Scratch, they're pointed to a project in the welcoming committee gallery. So if you become a member of the welcoming committee, you make a project to welcome a newcomer, and that initiates a conversation between an experienced member of the community and one of the newcomers. So again, we see all these different ways that the peers are supporting the learning process. So again, the, the, our second P is peers. We want to make sure that to support creative learning, you need to have a peer-based community where people are working with and supporting one another. The third P is passion. I think one thing that we know and has certainly been a central element of the constructionism community for many years is the understanding that a lot of the most important and best learning happens when you work on things that you're passionate about, things you really care about. And we've seen that when people are really passionate, they're willing to work harder, persist longer in the face of, of challenges, uh, so we want to make sure that people are working on projects along with peers on themes and ideas that they're really passionate about. We didn't want to create a system where everyone is just making one type of game. Some people might like that, others wouldn't. So we want to make sure that everyone can find their own pathway into learning to express themselves and to create projects in Scratch. One indicator to us that this is working is the great diversity of projects on the website. So there's now about six million projects on the website, and if you look there, you see this unbelievable diversity. As we look, we're always seeing new genres of projects that kids are creating. Everything from interactive stories, to interactive birthday cards, to anime comic strips, to virtual construction kits, to recreations of classic video games, to dress up doll games, to tutorials, to animated artwork uh, to science simulations. So we see just this wide range of projects, and to us, that's an indicator that people are able to work on things they care about. So they're all, and we know that people have so many different interests and passions, and this is a way that we see that they're able to you know, follow their passions in Scratch to work on things they really care about. And again, I want to point out the difference between this and many websites for children these days. If you look through many of the online communities for young people, a lot of the driving force is not young people building on their own interests and passions, but young people competing for points and prizes and rewards and badges. So there's been through this embracing of what's sometimes called gamification, of turning every activity into a game where if you succeed at something, you get points or rewards. And actually, there's research that shows in the short term that people will you know, dive into it and persist longer because they're going to get rewards or points or prizes at the end. On the other hand, there's also research that shows that this is not a good strategy for long-term learning. There's a quote from the book Drive where Daniel Pink writes, rewards can deliver a short-term boost, just as a jolt of caffeine can keep you cranking for a few more hours. But the effect wears off, and worse, can reduce a person's long-term motivation to continue the project. So this is a real concern of ours, that we see the whole world embracing what we see as a very short-term strategy that can give you a caffeine boost, as Daniel Pink says, but not going to lead to a long-term motivation. And the research also shows that it has the most negative effect on creative activities. If it's just a mundane activity where you need to get something done in a repetitive way, prizes are shown that can get people to work longer or harder. But for creative activities, it's shown that it has the opposite effect. It's a demotivating effect. So these are things we've tried to take into account as we've developed the Scratch online community. Uh, if you look on Scratch, you won't see prizes and rewards. Um, of course, there are people that get their projects, rec people, certain projects are recognized. So, but we try to focus on projects that are going to be seen as valuable by the rest of the community. We try to have 
sort of the currency of the community be the project that people are working on, not the prizes or rewards. If you go to someone's profile page on Scratch, I went, I just grabbed this. This is from someone whose project was just featured on the homepage of Scratch earlier this week. But it doesn't say on this profile, you know, that his project was recently profiled, that was recently featured. We don't highlight that. Instead, what we want people to focus on is give people a place to say what they're working on. What are people doing? That's what we want people to be known for. Or the list of projects. So the portfolio of your projects is what we want to emphasize as opposed to the prizes or rewards or badges that you've earned. Finally, we look at the fourth P of play. Sometimes I, I think of this as the most misunderstood P. Because sometimes people will think that, well, we see kids playing all the time. Kids are playing games all the time, so this one is covered. We know that kids are doing a lot of play. But I think the word play gets used in different ways. When we're thinking about the role of play in creative learning, it's a particular type of play. When we think of play, we see it as a type of attitudes towards the world, an approach to engaging with the world. It's about a playfulness and a playful attitude, which means being willing to take risks, trying new things, testing the boundaries, constantly experimenting and iterating. So that's our vision of play, is not just doing something to have fun, but doing something to experiment and try and adapt. So we're happy when we see this happening on the Scratch website, and we're always thinking, how can we support that better on the website? Because it's not that it happens all the time, so we're always thinking, how can we support it better? Here's one example that we saw that we saw as a good example where we do see it happening. This was a little animation that someone was making. Oh, this a running animal with wings. Well, the first thing to capture our attention, we like this as my dragon game, not finished. So first of all, I sort of like that someone is posting something when it's not finished and saying, I'm in process of this. And in fact, they put it up there to get feedback from others. So that's an experimental attitude towards the world of being willing to try things out, get feedback. If you then take a look at what the person wrote, they said, this is all I have right now. I work on being able to run back and forth without the rock disappearing. Any tips or help? This is just a stage in a long process. So they're very explicit about they know this is an ongoing process. They're trying things out. They want feedback. A few weeks later, they wrote in a comment below, I was just tinkering with the scripts in the game, and I finally figured out how to make it so you could run back and forth. I'll fix up the game, put out a new improved version. So you've been using the word tinkering a word we often use to capture the spirit of trying things out, testing things, iterating, uh, constantly trying to uh, improve the things you're working on. So then they posted a new version, and this time the dragon really can run back and forth. But I like that the name of the game is still my dragon game, still not finished. <laughs> so it's an ongoing process that doesn't come to an end. Let me give one more example for, of play. Another way that the, I see the word play used in multiple ways, my colleague Marina Bears, who's a professor at Tufts University in child development, she wrote a book a few years ago where the subtitle of the book was From Playpen to Playground. So both have their roots in play, but part of Marina's point was a playpen can be confining. It's a place where you put kids to make sure they don't get into trouble, is oftentimes a way. And again, there can be creative playpens, I know. But a general part is to make sure they don't get in trouble. Where a playground is more designed to where you can experiment, use your explore, try new things. So I think what Marina is saying from playpen to playground is how can we design new technology to have more of a feel of a playground and not a playpen? So that we can encourage people to experiment, explore, imagine, try new things as you do on a playground. And in this spirit, our group has been working with Marina's group to Tufts on a project called Scratch Junior, where we try to bring this playful, tinkering approach to programming down to younger kids. Marina has done a lot of work with younger kids in early childhood. With Scratch, we aimed at ages eight and up. And with Scratch Junior, we focused more on ages five to seven, in age range where Marina had already done work. So we developed a tablet version of Scratch and simplified so that young kids like these could start in the early stages, 
a simplified version, but still engaging in the same core activities, the activities of being able to put things together to express yourself. So we have, again, a, a simplified box language, fewer words, because you know, we're, it's, it's pre-literate for some of the kids. A simplified uh, coordinate system to use just small integers. Let me try briefly, I'll try to give a quick demo, we'll see if this can work. So you can just see how this... So Scratch Junior was just released in the last couple of weeks. So it's now available for free, as are all other aspects of Scratch, they're all available for free. This is available for free right now on the iPad, so you can get from the Apple App Store. It'll be available on other platforms later. But to give you an idea, if I want to make the cat move to the right, I pull out, move to the right. I tap it, it goes to the right. If I want to go further, I can change the number. Rather than go forward one, I'll say go forward three. It goes forward further. This is to jump. I tap it, it jumps. I snap them together, I now have a program to move and jump. If I want to do this repeatedly, I can go to a different category and pull out a repeat block. Put those blocks inside. Now it'll move and jump four times. So again, playing with these simple blocks, we now have the two characters coming together. If I want to investigate the numbers, I can put in the grid system. You can see it goes from 0 to 20. And you'll see if the cat starts at two and goes forward three goes forward three four times, it ends up at fourteen. So again, a way to start playing with numbers as you're doing this. And again, you can add other backgrounds and other scenes. Um, again, for those who are interested, we are doing a hands-on workshop. Champik and I were doing a hands-on workshop. We were able to bring ten iPads, so some people without iPads, you know, feel free to come and we can work together on the iPads and we can I'll uh, show you a little bit more about the work we've been doing with that. So that's a quick run through of these sort of four P's of projects, peers, passion, and play. Um, as I said, I feel that these are four guiding principles that grow very much from the roots of ideas in the constructionist community. But it's a way that we find useful as we're doing our own design, whether it's design of technologies or design of activities, to try to uh, stay true to the idea of supporting young people as creative thinkers. Um, by following these four P's, our hope is that we'll be able to create both environments and activities that aren't just about letting kids become competent with new technologies, but engaging them in about thinking about the world in new ways, thinking about themselves in new ways, being able to be full and active participants in a society that's going to require creative thinking more than ever before. Thanks very much.